Thank you so much for coming today on this rainy spring day. Um, my name is Rebecca Taffel and I'm Director of Programs at the Elizabeth A. Sackler Foundation, um, which helps to support the wonderful Sackler Center staff here um, with additional programming. And I'm really happy to welcome all of you here today um, and to have Karen Averitt read from Sasha and Emma, the Anarchist Odyssey of Alexander Berkman and Emma Goldman. Um, for the past six years, the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art has continued to fulfill its commitment to the past, present, and future of feminist art. Using its award-winning exhibition space, uh, and educational spaces, the Sackler Center strives to raise awareness of feminism's cultural contributions. Dialogue and debate about feminist art, theory, and activism take place at the Sackler Center Forum here, and groundbreaking exhibitions are held in its feminist and her story galleries. Currently, the galleries are featuring two remarkable shows, um, Worked by Hand, Hidden Labor, and Historical Quilts, and um, Kathy Colwitz, Prints from the War and Death Portfolios. Yet the center's success relies on more than its gallery spaces. It's a place that celebrates open and free discourse, conversation, and the exchange of ideas. Dr. Sackler could not be here today, unfortunately, um, because of some ongoing health issues. But she asked me to express how delighted she is to have Karen Everett here um, reading from the book. Uh, the dual biography of Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman written in collaboration by Karen and her late father, the distinguished scholar and historian Paul Average. Um, describing the book Sasha and Emma as both densely detailed and lively and containing many surprises, uh, New York Times book review editor Elsa Dixler concludes, Sasha and Emma is an enormously rich book offering an absorbing portrait of the world of anarchists in turn of the century America and the loving yet competitive partnership at its center. Dr. Sackler and I couldn't agree more. We both enjoyed discovering um, the insights into the lives of these 20th century progressives and radicals. Um, and on an additional and related note, Emma Goldman is featured on the heritage panels um, on the floor of the dinner party. So it's really nice to have the connection between um, current ongoing scholarship uh, and, and the dinner party out in the other room. So I, if you haven't stopped by to see Judy Chicago's The Dinner Party, I recommend doing that afterwards. Um, Karen Average is a writer and editor living here in New York, and I'm pleased to welcome her here today to read from the book, uh, to answer any questions after she's done. And then there is a signing of the book uh, downstairs in the lobby, and I'll help direct all of you down after we're finished. Um, so without further delay, Karen Average. Thank you so much, Rebecca. It's really um, an honor to be here. Um, I actually, my senior year of college in my art history class, I studied Judy C Chicago's um, dinner party, so it's, it's especially nice. And, and thank you so much for having me, um, particularly on such a beautiful day when I'm sure you'd all rather be outside in Prospect Park. Um, this book is about Alexander Berkman and Emma Goldman. They were two um, radicals, both of whom immigrated to the United States when they were teenagers in the 1880s. And they met in 1889, um, at, he was about 19, she was about 20, and ha instantly hit it off. And um, on their very first date, he took her, he had been here about, in Manhattan, in, the, in New York, for about New York City for about um, a year and a half, and she's just arrived. She had been living in Rochester and New Haven. And so he decided to take her on the city. The first place he took her was, um, they rode the L down to the Brooklyn Bridge. And on one of their next dates, he took her to Prospect Park because he told her, having scouted out the whole city, that um, he preferred it to Central Park because he found it um, less cultivated, more natural. So they were here too. Um, this book is um, my father, Paul Average, was a, um, was a historian, a professor of Russian history and anarchism. When he was um, still a student, he became drawn to the um, fields of radical thought. And when he started meeting actual anarchists, he became passionate about the subject. And um, in the 1960s and 70s, he started traveling around, meeting with all these people who had been uh, active in the, in the turn of the century, uh, hearing their stories, listening to them, remember their exploits. And they all, many of them had actually worked with um, Emma Goldman and, and Alexander Berkman and had incredible stories to tell. And it was his great 
dream to always write the book about the two of them. Uh, their lives were so intertwined that he felt it was a, a, a dual biography was essential. Uh, but then, unfortunately, he became ill, and um, when it became clear to him that he wasn't going to be able to finish the project, he'd been spending, he had had decades worth of of interviews and notes, and he had traveled all over the world getting their letters and photographs. He asked me to take over the project, um, and I said yes, rather foolhardily. Mm -hmm. um, and, but as I started to get to know, um, and then he, he died soon after, and, um, and I was left with this massive, incredible information, and I started to put it together. And um, not only was I um, just amazed, I just finally understood why he I was so drawn to these two people for so long. I had been hearing about Sasha and Emma in the house since I was a you know, tiny little child. Um, I was also struck by not just their commitment to their causes, but also to um, the incredible cinematic sweep of their lives. Um, so it was indeed an odyssey that, that, um, that we were writing about. Um, both of them had um, rather similar upbringings. They both were born in Lithuania. Um, in, um, she, Emma Goldman was born in 1869. Uh, Alexander Berkman Sasha um, in 1870. It was a part of the Russian empi Empire at the time under the Tsar. Um, and both of them were from Jewish families, although uh, he, his family is well to do. Hers rather less so, but they, um, both of them were, were very alert children and aware of this, the turmoil, the radical turmoil sweeping around them. Um, in, in 1881, the Tsar Alexander II was assassinated and this brought in um, a new Tsar who uh, had all sorts of, um, uh, some of the um, advances that his father had put into place, he rolled back. And so Sasha and Emma were raised in uh, rather a hostile environment. And both had great dreams of what the United States might be like. They were just desperate to get out. Um, Emma was, um, was the daughter, her father was quite uh, abusive and difficult. And his view was that women were only good to um, bear children and cook, and she, wants, she said she wanted to see the world, to travel, to do things, to learn things. Um, so they clashed a great deal, mm -hmm. and so finally she convinced him when she was a teenager to let her go to the United States with her um, half, older half-sister, and that's when she arrived in, in Rochester in 1886. Sasha, meanwhile, um, at this point, even though he, he was, grew up in a um, very well-off family, um, he was orphaned by the time he was 17 and very difficult. Um, could not get along with anyone, and finally, um, his uncle, who, he, whose care he was under, let him also go off to the United States. And they both had these grand dreams of what America would be like after um, the um, oppression of Tsarist Russia. Although um, they used to carry with them the excitement and drama of the things they'd witnessed the assassination of the Tsar, the rise of the, the, these terrorists, these young populists who, whose view was in Russia, if you wanted to make a protest, you threw a bomb, uh, fired a gun, you had your day in court, and then you were sent off to Siberia or executed. So this is what the seeds were inside of them of what true rebellion was, and, and they carried that with them to the United States. And both of them, as teenagers, got jobs in factories, and, and Sasha um, was, lived on the Lower East Side, um, got to know a lot of radical groups. Um, he was fired up by um, the anarchist movement. Um, at, in, around the same time in Chicago, there was an event um, in the, the Haymarket Square um, in which a group of, um, a bunch of anarchists were meeting and a bomb was thrown and um, the police reacted and as a result, a lot of people were killed, including eight police officers. And um, eight anarchists were um, tried, um, although none of, there was no evidence to suggest that any of them were guilty. In fact, none of them were guilty. Four were hanged. One of them um, was meant to be hanged, but the day before his hanging, was, he committed suicide in his cell. This was the Haymarket event, and it, um, it, it drew both Emma and Sasha to anarchism. They were, uh, Sasha had been reading about it in the library back in um, Kovno in, the Russian, in Lithuania, and he was in intrigued by this. Emma was already here in the United States, and she was followed the trial carefully and was horrified when these anarchists were put to death. And she said this is the thing that fired her up and, and, and in inspired in her and instilled in her a lifelong dream to, to follow their, um, their path and, and try to, to, br to bring about change, social change in America. Um, so, because while she was disillusioned by her experiences, she came to the United States. She got the same. It seems to be the same as Russia. She was working in a factory. There were dramatic differences between rich and poor. She still had hope and faith that, this, that there was a chance for this country to really bloom. 
And, uh, and so in 1889, as I said, they, um, the two of them met on the Lower East Side. She decided to move. She had been married in Rochester. She was bored, so there was a fellow factory worker who she married. And then they got divorced, and then they got married again, and then she left him for good. <laughs> and um, and she, just, she just really wanted to um, forge her own path. And she and Sasha bonded instantly. They had this incredible connection that she, they both of them described later in life as something that it actually lasted 50 years, something that neither of them could explain, neither of them could control. Um, they started out as lovers and then just became friends, and it, but they were completely connected, like two puzzle pieces, like soulmate, they said. And they decided that the two of them were going to change the world. Um, at this point, they were joined by um, Sasha's cousin, Matska, who had come also, also come over from Russia. And the three of them plotted together, and they thought, we have to um, use our wiles and our intellect, and we're going we're to inspire the workers to revolt against the capitalist system and we're gonna, America's gonna be the golden place that we'd hoped it would be. And at around the same time, they'd been living together um, as a menage a trois, I should point out. Um, off and on, uh, Emma was a big, they all were big proponents of free love. Sometimes it sort of got in the way with um, romance and other things, but they, they felt it was too bourgeois to, um, to you know, deal with things like jealousy. Um, they also had, um, they had joined an anarchist movement, the Autonomous Group. Initially, they had been linked with another anarchist who was a very powerful speaker who noticed that Emma was a great orator herself. She was only 20 at the time. This man's name was Johann Most, who was a very famous German anarchist who um, attracted great audiences on the Lower East Side and all over, all over the world he, um, when he was in Europe and then the United States. And he felt that she really had a spark. And so he encouraged her to start speaking out again uh, for, uh, on behalf of um, labor rights, and she found she did indeed have a voice, although she was always, even throughout her entire life, even speaking um, into her 60s when she would track thousands of people to her, her lecture, she would always take a drink of whiskey and pace nervously back and forth before getting up on stage onto the, to speak onto the podium. Um, so with the whole, uh, their whole lives ahead of them, at this point, um, they were, uh, the Homestead Steel Strike broke out in Pennsylvania, in uh, Pittsburgh. Um, this was a, a, a steel plant owned by Andrew Carnegie and operated by Henry Clay Frick. And, um, uh, they, and the two of them were determined, Frick especially, to, to crush the strike. The workers wanted fair wages, they wanted to increase, things had been going well. Um, and Frick made it his business to um, end the strike by every means necessary, including bringing in Pinkertons, the, um, the sort of hired, uh, hired soldiers, hired um, pit bulls of the era, uh, notorious for their, their brutality and uh, mercenary instincts. And um, Sasha, Emma, and Sasha's cousin uh, observed this with horror, but also with excitement, because they thought, here's not, the, the country had been following this, the events, um, there, were, there was a battle, at, at one point the workers were, um, you know, waged a battle against the Pinkertons and actually won, got a lot of national attention. And they thought, this is our opportunity. This is our opportunity to take a step, to do as the, as the terrorist populace did in Russia, and to um, make a decisive um, mark and convince the workers, galvanize them into action, and show them this is their opportunity to rise up against the capitalist class and take over. So their, their goal was to assassinate none other than Henry Clay Frick himself. Um, these, these, you know, they were, um, they were at the time 21, 22, um, just, you know, rip, whipped up into a fervor by all the um, experiences of the last couple of years in the United States. Uh, they're, they're radical groups. They've been meeting with people all over the Lower East Side, all these exciting ideas to them. And violence seemed to be a perfectly plausible um, reaction to, to how to get things done. It wasn't ideal, but to, to them, he was not really a man. He was merely a symbol of capitalist evil. And, he, and in order to, in order to improve the world, you had to take serious steps. So the three of them plotted to take him out. Um, they, had, they had been operating, they had been living in Massachusetts at this time, operating a little lunchroom. Emma Goldman was a spectacular cook, and they um, had sort of thought about maybe going back to Russia, but they stayed in, and, um, and, um, and started making a lot of money, and, and then the homestead event occurred, and so they left the place, they, had all, they took their money, and they used it to buy weapons to, um, Sasha decided he was going to um, uh, take out Frick with some, with some bombs. He made some bombs. He tested them on Staten Island, and they did not go off. And um, they decided he'd have to find a new, a new solution. I mean, again, they were, they were a little haphazard, these, um, these wild planners. Um, 
So he decided it would be, uh, he'd use a pistol. And um, he went off to Pittsburgh where um, Frick lived, um, stayed with some anarchist comrades, started um, scouting out the um, uh, Frick's um, mansion in, in the suburbs and also his um, office in downtown Pittsburgh. Um, Emma, meanwhile, because they had, at this point, they had limited funds, could not go with him. It was a big uh, sore point for her. She really wanted to be at Sasha's side when he um, did the deed. Um, again, the, uh, they, they referred to it as propaganda by deed, and that um, acting, at, um, creating a, a national discussion with one big act. And um, so, while well, he was in Pittsburgh, um, hanging out and stalking his victim, um, Emma decided to raise some money, and she felt the only thing she could the only thing she could do at this point she was she was inspired by Sonia in Crimes and Punishment, Crime and Punishment, and um, went out decided she was going to become a prostitute for the night to raise some funds. And so she she was um, a petite woman with blonde hair and, and brilliant blue eyes, and she looked in her, the mirror and she decided she could um, pass herself off as a prostitute. Bought her first pair of high heels, went down to 14th Street started strutting around to see, um, you know, what would happen. And every time a man approached her, she would run in the opposite direction. <laughs> so uh, finally, uh, and, and a gentleman, with a white-haired gentleman, came up to her and said, you know, come let me buy you a beer. He took her to a saloon, he bought her a beer. He said, this is your first time doing this. She said, yes. He said, it's not for you. Uh, Here's $10, go home. And she said, um, she wrote in her memoirs later that this was the first time in her whole life that she had met any man who wasn't either a vulgarian or an idealist. So <laughs> it was her first experience with that. So she sent money to Sasha. He got himself a suit. At the time, the strike was ongoing. So his, his plan was to pass himself off as, as, a, um, uh, as, um, uh, he, as a, someone with, who could provide workers to Frick, who was still looking for um, scabs, strike breakers. So he got himself a suit and some business cards um, with an alias on them. Uh, bought himself a 38 caliber pistol, and he had a knife with him that he had made himself. And so on, in 1892, July 23rd, he gathered his courage about him, uh, went down to Frick's office, um, staked him out, you know, had a couple of false starts, and then finally burst into Frick's office, took out his gun, and started shooting. Hit him twice, once in the shoulder, once in the shoulder blade. He tried to go for him a third time, but um, Frick's Vice President who was sitting with him, this man named Leishman, grabbed Berkman from behind and the final shot went into the um, ceiling. Sasha was undeterred. He lunged at Frick, took out his, little, his knife and started stabbing at him. Uh, by this point, there was chaos. People were coming in from the outside of the office. Uh, people could see them out on the street. Um, on the street, this was right, you know, crowded downtown Pittsburgh. They could see people from across the way, could see through the window what was going on. But while well, Berkman was a, 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 small, uh, a small, wiry man, he was very tough, very strong, and finally it took a carpenter bursting in with a hammer hitting him on the head and a couple of other people to finally pull him off of Frick. And um, Frick, who was badly injured, um, a police officer came in and, and someone asked if, if he wanted, um, if they wanted uh, Sasha to be shot. And Frick said no, but pull his head back and let me see his face. And the two men looked at each other and Frick was very badly injured and Sasha looked at him and the symbol of capitalist evil and for the first time he saw not a cis symbol but actually a man, a man, a bleeding wounded man and he felt this, this feeling of remorse and guilt as he looked at him and then he felt terribly ashamed because he was a revolutionist, you're not supposed to feel these things and so he dashed that sense of sensation away and they dragged him off to, uh, to jail. Frick meanwhile, um, Doctors came in, doctors, there had been some doctors in the area who had come in. He had actually just been dining, for, had a lunch date with his own doctor. And so um, he, um, they removed the bullets, they patched him up, they sent him home. And he, he remained pretty stalwart throughout. Meanwhile, Sasha, um, in the prison, people were fascinated by this act. They couldn't imagine why he had done it. They didn't understand his philosophy. They didn't understand that he was an anarchist who was inspired by... Um, by the events that occurred in, in Russia and the United States, that, that he, he had a whole plan. They thought he was crazy. They thought he was just some, some lunatic foreigner. Um, he had no relationship with any of the, the, the men, the striking men in, in, at the Homestead plant. Um, and he was, um, 
terribly upset by this um, reaction. And even some of the people in jail who we thought surely would understand, some of the more strikers themselves, they didn't get it. They're like, well, you know, why would you go after this man? And as a result, instead of helping the cause, some people thought he actually hurt the cause. Um, meanwhile, Emma was still in New York. She had, um, she had, uh, you know, been asked because this was 1892. The only way she'd get the information was to wait at Park Row for the newspapers the next day. And when she found out that Frick had, had lived, initially she was disappointed. Then she realized, well, at least Tasha won't be put to death for this crime. So she was a combination of, of, of uh, sorrow and relief. And she decided that she was going to dedicate her life to speaking out and explaining Sasha's act. If he was going to have to go to prison, she was going to stay do, do her best to support him. Um, Sasha's trial lasted four hours, um, and he was um, sentenced to 22 years. Uh, he was 21 years old at this point, um, and um, and faced you know faced the rest of his youth behind bars. Um, and he was not a very good prisoner, I will say. He was um, he uh, he fought back against the system. He uh, clashed with the warden. He um, he wrote. He worked on underground. Uh, news, a new, underground newspaper. Um, he was constantly, you know, trying to reveal the corruption. He was horrified by what was going on in the prison. And but there he was. He there he was for 13 the next 13 years. He would eventually get have some some of his time scaled back. Um, meanwhile, Emma herself um, spent the next 10 years getting famous. She um, after Sasha went to prison, she she began to speak more and more until she was very well known in New York. Uh, many people would come out to see her speak. She, was, she had this incredible gift for oratory and um, a lot of great ideas. She didn't speak just about anarchism, but about freedom of speech, freedom of the press, eventually uh, homosexuality, women's rights, and uh, she was incredibly compelling. She herself also had an experience she, in prison. She, um, she was speaking in um, Union Square in, um, in 1893, in August of 1893, and this was there, there, a serious depression was going on, and many workers were out of work. And she, she told the people in the square, there are several thousand people, about four thousand people. She said, um, "Demonstrate before the palaces of the rich. If they if, uh, demand work, if they won't give you work, demand bread. If they won't give you bread, take it." And for this, she was arrested, and she was sentenced to a year on Blackwell's prison, which was you know, Roosevelt Island, once called Blackwell's Island. And she herself um, made good use of her time there. She. Um, just as Sasha, by, by the way, was spending a great deal of his time reading and learning and educating himself about, uh, he learned great, a lot of languages in prison. His English had not been perfect until that point. Both of them were quite well educated in, in Russia, and they spoke um, Russian and German and Yiddish, but um, or Sasha picked up Yiddish in, in New York. But, um, they really, but Sasha really perfected his English, both his writing and his speaking and his reading when he was in prison. And Emma also um, read a great deal, and um, she, um, she had spent some time in the infirmary when she first arrived and befriended the doctor who gave her some nursing training, a skill that um, she would enhance when she studied in Vienna after she got out of prison and then would, would help her through her whole life, always as a fallback career. When you're not being a radical, you could be a, a seamstress or a, a nurse or a cook. That's something she did. And when she, was, when she got out of prison, um, uh, a year older and wiser, um, she, uh, as I said, began to lecture around the country. She would go out on these lecture tours, attract a great deal of attention. Um, and some people called her the queen of the anarchists. Some people were afraid of her. Some people found her fascinating. Students came to see her, people from all walks of life, uh, liberals, libertarians, um, rich people, poor people. And um, she really was making quite a name for herself um, until, and, and until um, she became infamous in 1901 when, um, uh, she had, you know, at this point, she'd been she'd been very well traveled. She had, she'd been all over across the, the um, Europe. She would she would often talk about the there was a whole rash of assassinations that were going on at this period in the eighteen in the eighteen nineties in Europe, of um, of leaders and um, and um, uh, kings and various rulers, and she would always defend the assassin. Under uh, all, she always said it's always the ruler's fault. They're the ones who are oppressing the people and. You know, the, their, the heart, their heart's in the right place, she'd say about these various assassins. And when in 1901, um, she was speaking in Cleveland, and um, a man over, listened to her speech and was fascinated. Um, and he came up to her and talked to her afterwards, and he had a charming face. And Emma was always kind of a sucker for a, 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 a sweet-looking face. She, um, she was, um, she really, um, 
She really enjoyed um, her, a good flirtation. And this man appealed to her, um, and he was interested in what she had to say. And um, he started hanging around the anarchist, the anarchist she knew in, in, um, in Chicago and Cleveland. And they started talking about him. A lot of her friends were concerned. They said, he's weird. This man is a strange man. He's asking a lot of peculiar questions. He seems to think there are secret societies. We're worried about him. She said, oh, he's fine. He's very nice. She, she met him twi exactly twice, once after her speech, and then once um, he sort of encountered her when she was on her way out of town. This man, whose name was Leon Chogos, and he, um, in September, um, went to the, pan the, the um, went to Buffalo and assassinated uh, President William McKinley. And when the, people, the police arrested him and asked him why he had done it, he said that, um, that Emma Goldman's words set him on fire. And he also had been um, greatly inspired by a man named, named Bresci, who, uh, Italian, who had assassinated King Umberto of Italy. And he carried around a clipping of, this, of, of the assassination description in his wallet. And um, he felt that this is, you know, this was, he, he claimed he was an anarchist and said that um, he had to commit this act. And so he, um, he was arrested, uh, tried, and, and then um, executed, uh, put to death um, the following month. Things were very speedily back then. Um, <laughs> And McKinley died after, after several weeks, and Emma became one of the most hated and feared women in America. She, um, she had no idea this was happening. She read about the papers in St. Louis. She finally she noticed that it was the man that she said, oh, he had given his name, not as, he had not given his real name to her. He would called himself Niemann, or no, nobody in German. Um, but she had not picked up on that at the time. And um, she, she was um, tracked down by the police. She hid out for a couple of days. She was um, undercover. She was. Um, riding on a train back to Chicago, a lot of her anarchist friends were being pursued, um, persecuted by the police and uh, rounded up and, and interrogated because this terrible thing had happened to the President of the United States. The, the, the country was in turmoil and they were in a panic to see if there was some sort of conspiracy or what exactly had gone on. And so she decided she'd, um, she was, she was going to go to Chicago to see what she could help out. And she was hiding out in the train and she overheard um, all the people on the tram, a bunch of people near her, talking about the beast Goldman and how horrifying she was and how what a terrible person. And she had this notion that maybe she would jump out and you know, boo and scare them, but she decided that it would not be a good idea. Um, and so eventually the police, um, police uh, interrogate her. She said um, that she had nothing to do with it and eventually could not find any connection and she was set, let go. But she continued to praise and defend, even though a lot of the anarchists were horrified by this, they had no <coughs> issue with McKinley, they didn't see any point in it. Even Sasha thought it was a stupid thing to do and it made no sense. He said, there's no propaganda in it, there's no point in it. it was, you know, and she was sort of the lone voice, you know, sort of stubbornly defending this man, and, um, and uh, even her community temporarily turned against her. And for, for a year she went into hiding. Um, you know, went back to her nursing, um, stepped away from the anarchist movement, although she came raging back uh, after, after a year or so. Um, Sasha, meanwhile, was um, still locked up in prison, uh, making trouble. Um, he had, he had, there had been some efforts to get him pardoned um, here and there. He had, he, had, he had not had a lawyer at his trial because he thought that's what people did in Russia. You just stood up and you made your statement. And, um, and then you were carted off. He'd, and he thought that the legal system was just part of um, bureaucracy and government and everything he hated. And so as a result, when, during his four hour trial, he had spent um, an hour reading, he had spent an hour in, uh, speaking in German because he didn't feel comfortable in English at that point. And it was translated by someone who could barely speak apparently either English or German. And so it was just a whole disaster from beginning to end. So there were some efforts to, to get him um, pardoned, which failed. And so in 1900, at this point, he had been in jail for about eight years with another decade to go, or so he thought, um, he decided he was going to attempt to break out. And um, he, Emma actually was um, sort of helped him get some money together and, and got the people involved. And then she went out, out to, to, you know, got out of the country to Europe, which she was planning to do as well. She thought it was best just as well because so much attention was always focused on her. And um, so uh, at this point, he had some access, a friend of his, a, a a fellow prison mate had just been released and had smuggled some blueprints of the prison outside the walls and brought them to the anarchists and they rented a house across the street from the prison and the plan was to dig a tunnel directly in from the basement across the street and up into the prison grounds. Sasha, who had been there for eight years at this point, had been given a job as arrangement on the prison, so he had occasional access to the outside and he knew that if there was a tunnel with a hole, he could at some point get to um, you know, get to this area right by the gate um, and, and, and slip out. And so 
uh, they, the neighbors thought this was very, so, so notice the odd goings on at this house near the prison. They, they heard, um, the, you know, this couple arrived. They didn't seem to bring much with them except a piano. And the piano was played night and day. Um, and when it stopped playing, um, there they were these two spinster ladies, the McCarthy sisters, um, next, at the house next door, and they said they would play all day long. And then the, um, and when they stopped, you'd hear a sound like a, like a, like a, grind, a coffee grinder. And what it was was the people digging, and they'd, they'd hired a couple of miners from a nearby mine, and then they had a, an anarchist comrade um, uh, so, so, you know, organizing the digging, and they dug this extremely narrow tunnel, and they actually managed to do it all the way across the street and up into the prison yard. Um, and the, the, the female anarchist, uh, her name was, she was a, an anarchist from Chicago, she was a very good musician, and she would play and sing to hide, to hide the noise of the digging. And Emma Goldman later wrote in her memoirs that the... Um, that the prison guards who were paroling the, patrolling the walls really enjoyed the music. Mm -hmm. um, so the day of the Hiv's big escape, uh, Sasha was, um, went about his, went to his rounds. He had his pet birds that his, his sort of claim was he had to take them out to give them fresh air. Um, he, he went to the place where they discussed um, the, the whole wood removal, which was sort of like a shed on the, you know, on the outskirts of the prison grounds. And to his great disappointment, there had just, there had been, Coincidentally, some uh, construction work on the prison grounds and the place where the hole was and sort of s hidden away, someone had dumped a huge pile of bricks just coincidentally, just as he was about to leave. Um, you know, there, and he knew, he knew there was a suit waiting for him. There was this, you know, in the, in the kitchen at this house, there was a suit with money. He was going to, um, you know, his friends had said, you know, you're, you'll crawl underneath the ground. You'll get, you'll, you know, you'll change out of your prison garb. You'll take your money. You'll, you'll flee to Paris and we'll all be celebrating in Paris, you know, before the end of the week. And here he was seeing this giant mass of bricks and there was no hope. And he was completely devastated. And a few, a little bit, shortly after this, some kids were playing and discovered the, the hole and they called them the police, and the police were baffled. They could not imagine. They, there's, some, there's some newspaper reports that say, um, you know, they thought possibly it was Alexander Berkman who had been trying to escape, but they, they didn't think he could possibly have had the wherewithal to manage this extraordinary, expensive uh, event. They, they thought maybe it was a, a, the famous train, there was a, a famous train robber, there was a, a, a jewel thief, um, a safe cracker. They thought these were other options, but they never solved it. And he was stuck um, returning to uh, life in prison and waiting out his, um, the end of his term, which, which happened finally in 1906, 13 years in prison, one year in the workhorse, which he referred to as resurrection. Actually, the anniversary of it was yesterday, May 18th which he, said he thought of as his, as his new birthday, his new resurrection, um, the day when he was finally freed. And, um, and the two, and Emma and Sasha reunited. She had been his lifeline. She had written him letters. Um, she had, uh, they, had, they had very little contact. She was barred from the prison. She had, um, three months into a sentence, she had come to visit him under the guise of um, his sister, but uh, you know, she pretended to be his sister, but her, the jig was up and the warden recognized her and, and he was barred from having visitors and she'd only seen him occasionally, well, they'd managed to, um, to um, send letters back and forth. And they were just thrilled at being together again, although he was racked with a depression from his prison experience that would stay with him his whole life. Um, and he never been particularly cheery, although he was a, he was a wit. His, his, um, when my father talked to these anarchists, they all remembered, I mean, he's had this sort of fanatical um, passion. You know, Emma liked to, she liked to cook, she liked to dance, she, um, she loved to be, you know, have love affairs, and, um, and she liked fine things. And, um, and have a good time. Um, Sasha felt everything was about the cause. Oh, he had plenty of love affairs himself, um, including in prison. Um, but he, 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 um, he felt that everything was about the cause, but yet he was a, he was a, he was a and despite his sort of violent tendencies and these, um, and sort of the, you know, sort of unforgivable aspects related to those, he was, um, people remembered him as sweet and funny and wonderful with children and wonderful with animals. And it was one of the sort of the, um, the, the elements that attracted my father to, to, this, to this strange, interesting, complicated man. And, um, but this was a whole other chapter after his resurrection of their, of their lives together. Uh, Emma uh, started a magazine in 1906 that same year called Mother Earth which also put her on the map, and not just as a, as a radical order, but as a, a, someone with a real literary bent. People attracted all sorts of um, intellectuals and thinkers and writers and artists who contributed to it. And she really enjoyed um, that part of it. She was very protective of it, and it, and it lasted until 1917. 
Um, there another, there another thing that was, when I was doing the research and learning about, about them is, when I said it was a cinematic sweep, it's ridiculous. This period um, involved you know, bomb plots and, um, and all sorts of drama, including drama that um, you know, Emma ran a, a Russian theater company. It was just one thing after the other. Um, uh, a famous and tragic um, bombing incident in, um, in 1960 in, in San Francisco. And another thing that struck me is um, uh, in 1914, uh, 22 years after the, the, the Frick attempt, um, Berkman, um, Sasha became um, uh, livid. Um, th there was a similar incident at the Ludlow mine in Colorado that was run by John D. Rockefeller Jr. And um, there was, um, they hatched another plot, another assassination attempt. This is, what was striking to me about this is that 1914 had been a period, up leading 1913, 1914, there had been another serious depression and a lot of people were out of work. And um, there were a lot of demonstrations, peaceful demonstrations, that were almost identical in some ways to the Occupy Wall Street movement that sprang up. There were um, anarchists and radicals who, who gathered uh, hundreds of people to protest. Um, to, they, they would walk peacefully um, through Manhattan and end up at churches <coughs> and, and gathering places and, and ask for food or, play, or shelter. And, and then, um, and that combined with the um, this incident at Ludlow, where some miners were killed, and a National Guard came in. It was a terrible incident. Um, really started to um, provoke the United States to take another look at um, unemployment and, and the plight of the workers. And this was an opportunity for Sasha and Emma to, you know, to continue um, their goal. And for a while, there Sasha, um, despite his sort of you know, difficult past, was really on the, on, in, in the view of many, the side, the side of sort of the mainstream side. He'd, sp he'd speak out against uh, what Rockefeller was doing. He'd organize these huge um, rallies in Union Square. They would do these, um, they would, they'd have these mass peaceful protests where people would gather outside the Standard Oil Building, the Rockefeller Company, or the Rockefeller's homes, to quietly, silently, just, just, um, just to physically protest what was going on. And then, of course, um, Sasha's nature got the better of him, and he started plotting this um, a second assassination attempt, although he wasn't going to be involved this time because he had proven himself not particularly adept. Um, he was good at planning, but not so good at execution, so to speak. And, um, and so, um, and of course, there's also, uh, he had a, a bunch of his anarchist colleagues who, um, at this point, they were living on, um, up in, um, on a, like in, in, in Harlem. And some of his, they, there was the, the Lexington Avenue subway station was being built at this time. This was 1914, and they had been pilfering explosives and dynamite while it was going on. So they had this whole horde of dynamite, a group of his anarchist co colleagues, and uh, they built a little bomb and they decided they were going to take it out to um, Rockefeller's house. They had been protesting, a group of them had been protesting in Tarrytown, and, and the police and the, the villagers had been um, uh, uh, not very happy to see them. And of course, so they took the bomb out to Rockefeller's house. They were going to either throw it at his, you know, his, his car or, or try to get into the, to the house. And then in the, he wasn't even there. He had gone off to Maine. And so they came back with it. This was Independence Day, um, 1914. The next morning, the bomb went off. All the explosions, explosives that they had been collecting went off. And the, um, the, the brownstone was uh, destroyed. Fortunately, because it was January, it was July 4th, a lot of people were out at picnics. And so um, the, the, Three of the conspirators were killed, a, a bystander was killed, and a few people were injured. Um, and that's when, um, that was sort of uh, Sasha's last gasp of violence. He, he got out of town, went to San Francisco, started a magazine which he titled The Blast, because it wasn't really out of the system. And, um, and their, their final, uh, their final um, um, act on in, in America was in, in 1917. Sasha and Emma had um, reunited to protest the war. They, had, in, they were back in New York. They had organized a, non a new conscription league. And uh, at this point, they had attracted the attention of J. Edgar Hoover, who was at the time a 24-year-old working for Attorney General Palmer. And, uh, and they were arrested um, for conspiring against the draft. They had been giving some lectures, for some, they were hold, holding rallies and giving speeches against all of it. They claimed to have been very careful in their language to not sort of you know, uh, step on any any rules about what one could say at this point, because the United States was about to head into war, was heading to war, and, and had just you know they had been nervous about this since 1914 and, and and protesting against the Great War for those years. But when the United States decided to enter it, they they um, they took up um, their verbal arms, and um, 
And so in July of 1917, the, the, in June of 1917, they were arrested and brought into court. And, um, and they were tried and they were sent to prison and then um, deported in 1919. In, in her, um, at this point, Emma had, was, had a great passion for the United States. She considered herself an American, a New Yorker, and she loved the country and she thought of herself as a patriot. Her view was she was fighting for the rights of, to, to, for, for a better country. She was right for the votes of the people, the rights of the people. And she said to the, to the jury, she said, aren't there not different forms of patriotism? You don't necessarily, I'm not the kind of person who will stand up when they sing the national anthem, but I'm the kind of person who will try to make this country a better place. She said, I, it, we are like, um, I'm, she said, it's like, a, it's like a man who loves a woman he, with open eyes. He sees her beauty, yet he also sees her flaws. But uh, this, this did not go over well, and they were, as I said, convicted, sent off to prison for another um, 18 months, and then in December of 1919, they were sent back to Russia um, with other, other um, radicals who'd been rounded up in the Palmer Raids. J. Edgar Hoover um, went, went to the docks at um, 5 o'clock in the morning to see, make sure, see them off, make sure the boat went out, got them, took them back to Russia. And um, although, and while Emma was devastated to be leaving, they're also pretty excited because just as they had come over um, from Russia when they were teenagers with this hope that America would be this great place and it had been subsequently disillusioned and then sort of worked around that disillusionment, now they were excited because the Russian Revolution was ongoing. They had met Trotsky in, in New York. They were excited about what was going on. They would heard some rumblings from some of their Russian um, friends saying, you know, things aren't as great as you think, but they had hopes that this would be it. This was the revolution they'd been waiting for. This is, this, is gonna, this is gonna show the rest of the world how things are done, and they were thrilled at, at being able to participate in a way, even although they fought terribly to stay, to stay behind in the United States. They, they, were, um, they were excited to be going back to Russia. This, of course, they arrived. They, um, initially, things seemed pretty good. It was exciting. They met with Lenin, who um, congratulated them on their excellent speeches during their trial, sent them out to tour the country, to see what was what, to gather propaganda materials and, and, um, and help out with the cause. And then, of course, in, it was, um, in 1919, Soviet Russia, they saw all sorts of things that they'd not expect to see. Uh, people being rounded up and, and imprisoned, executed, the famine, um, people being um, uh, treated you know, the Soviets taking charge. It was, it was exactly what they what they'd feared. It was another dictatorship. Um, disillusionment sent in once more, and after two years, they fled. Um, and then they, the, the two of them, not able to go back to the United States, not wanting to go back to Russia, spent the, ne the rest of their lives um, in Europe and Canada. Um, uh, Emma um, was always desperate, as I said, to come back to the United States, and finally in 1934, she had petitioned for years. She finally was allowed to do so. She had been. Um, she had written a book when she was in, living in um, the south of France called "Living My Life," this thousand-page tome, in um, 1931. And Eleanor Roosevelt was a fan, and um, and so finally, after and she had all these famous friends, and they all petitioned to get her back. And so finally, she was allowed to come back for three months. And I'm going to just read briefly um, from her return. Sasha, of course, wanted nothing to do with it. He never really liked America. He'd spent a lot of his time in prison there. He said, you go, you have a good time, even if you get in, which I don't think you will. He was shocked when she actually was allowed a visa. Um, and, um, and so in 1934, she, um, she came over from, um, from, from Canada, um, you know, had a meeting with her family in Rochester, and, um, and then went off on her three-month her three tour of the United States. <clears throat> Emma's return was met with curiosity but little outcry. President Roosevelt's America was a rather different place from the country Goldman had left behind in 1919. Lecture agencies immediately offered to represent her and a number of groups signed up to hear her speak. Many in the public now regarded her as a bold woman with a complicated past rather than as a chilling specter of chaos. Even so, not everyone was pleased with Red Emma's reappearance. Editorials objected to the visit ran in newspapers around the country and some irate citizens took pains to make their sentiments known. Uh, Maud Murray Miller, a writer retired from the Columbus, Ohio Dispatch, contacted Eleanor Roosevelt expressing her dismay that Goldman had been granted a visa. I believe, quote, I believe her to be a grave menace to this country, wrote Murray Miller. The assassin of President McKinley said it was her influence that seduced him to commit this atrocious crime. I'm afraid that she may have designs upon the life of our beloved Roosevelt. He's accomplishing so much wonderful work that anarchists do not want this country to regain its former prosperity. It would be her first thought, I suggest, to remove him or have it done. And Mrs. Roosevelt wrote back, Thank you very much for your solicitude and interest in the president. He is very carefully protected, and in any case, Emma Goldman is now an old woman. I really think that this country can stand the shock of her presence for 90 days. I appreciate your writing, however, and hope you have not been unduly alarmed. And um, 
when she came back from, when she, when she arrived by train, there were a lot of her family and press were, were, were waiting for her. For the occasion, she wore a black felt hat and fur trim coat of a mild shade of red. Her thick glasses were red framed, her hair was cut in a simple bob. <clears throat> One reporter said, whereas once Red Emma was a name to frighten little children, she now looked like a motherly housewife or perhaps the president of the library committee of the local women's club. Her modest appearance aside, Golden was as blunt as ever. My views have not changed, she announced in Rochester. I'm still an anarchist. I'm the same. The world has changed. That's why I haven't had to. Everyone is an anarchist who loves liberty and hates oppression, but not everyone wants it for the other fellow. That is my task. I want to extend it to the other fellow. Um, and so she, um, she spoke at, um, she had some events in, in New York. She spoke at town, in town hall. She, um, Emma flatly denied that while on tour she would avoid topics of politics and the economy. I promise nothing, and pronounced herself free of resentment for all that had befallen her. Quote, I believe in the principle of letting people think for themselves, she explained, so why should I be bitter? A reporter wrote, the fires have cooled somewhat in the years, but they still burn. And she, so she spoke at town hall, and she, again, she had, they had had all sorts of um, discussions about what she could say. She was allowed to talk about theater and, and uh, a little bit about her book, nothing political. And so her first speech in town hall had, um, she talked only about uh, politics and the anarchist Peter Kropotkin and a eulogy, and she denounced Hitler. Um, and, uh, and, and her lawyer at the time told my father that, um, he said, this is what he said, to, he said, I personally vowed that Emma would make no political speeches during her stay here, and the first thing she did was to make a political speech. It was quite an occasion. Town hall was packed and people were hanging from the chandeliers. I thought the upper gallery would collapse, it was so heavy with people. She then also spoke at the, the uh, Brooklyn Academy of Music, and then she went around the country. She went to Washington, Kansas City. She traveled by plane. She told her lecture agent, quote, if the weather is good and the cost of flying, not much more, I shall fly. My friends have always charged me with living too much in the air. I might as well be guilty of their charges. And she went to um, Pittsburgh and she paid homage to um, the, the prison where, um, the Riverside prison where Sasha had, had been um, kept for 13 years. She called it his living grave and she wrote to Sasha about the experience. She couldn't bear to bring her, she couldn't bring herself to go in. She couldn't bear to see it. Um, but in Philadelphia, and members of Emma's welcoming committee told the New York Times that she, quote, had the appearance of a quiet housewife, considerably younger than her years. She warned the crowd about a threat, a threat in Germany. Financial and military interests are deliberately planning a war in Europe, she said. Hitler will last a long time. It's not just the man who stands out in Europe, but it is a mass movement, just as it is in Italy and Austria. Um, Emma was thrilled to be back on American soil, delighted to reconnect with her old friends and revisit her favorite haunts. Although she took issue with the president's policy, neither she nor Sasha had any faith in the New Deal, the nation's energy excited her. Quote, true America remains naive, childish in many respects in comparison to the sophistication of Europe, she said to Sasha. But I prefer its naivete. There is youth in it. There is still the spirit of adventure. There is something refreshing and stimulating in the air. The authorities followed her wherever she went. Um, one comrade attended, attended a speech near the tour said, quote, reporters were in detectives sat in the front row writing down everything she said. And she was a little bit careful, but um, Hoover considered um, that all the reluctant, even though she was careful with what her words, Hoover still said that um, her tone was, would, would deny her uh, further visits, so she was not going to be allowed back in. Um, nevertheless, Goldman was gratified by the respectful reception she'd received. Her life was deemed amazing by a host of journalists and elites, and she was recognized by some as a true admirer of the United States after years of being a branded a traitor. Quote, America's where I had my spiritual growth, she said in New York. I'm loyal to all that is cultural and fine in America. Um, she also talked about, um, she, um, Emma also chatted comfortably about her long-ago smoking habits. During a train trip, while she was seated with a group of interviewers in a Pullman dining car, she was pointed out that, quote, Miss Goldman was the only woman present not smoking. She had one smoke, she explained, but was forced to quit. Quote, back in 1890, I smoked 46 city cigarettes a day, she said. I think I started just to be different and shock people. Often I was thrown out of restaurants. Then in 1893, I was sent to Blackwell's Island Prison for a year. By that time, smoking had become a habit, and for two months, I suffered torture for want of a cigarette. Finally, I overcame the pangs of appetite. When I was discharged, I decided to never smoke again. I knew I'd be in jail so often and never want to suffer so again. In the end of April 1934, Emma's three months in Europe came to a close, and she departed with great reluctance. Quote, the trip to the United States has revived my spirit more than my 15 years in exile, she wrote to a friend before she left. If I ever had any doubts about my having roots in the United States, my short visit has dispelled them completely. I don't know what it is in America, but I felt years younger and full of vigor and enthusiasm. I felt a changed woman from the moment I arrived in New York, and my departure will be more painful than it was when Sasha and I were deported. But the experience was well worth the headache, and Emma was optimistic about the country's future. This is the age of youth, she told reporters during her tour. Youth now has the controls. Let's see what youth can do. The old ones made a mess of things. 
So she never came back to the United States, although um, when she was in Canada, at the end of her life, a young comrade of hers, um, who she actually helped save from being deported to Italy, where Mussolini would have had him killed, he would take her on long drives along the Detroit River, and she would sit and look out at America across the river and cry. Um, and, um, and she was very lonely for it and homesick for it. Um, and she finally died in um, Sasha, who was living in France, and he had committed suicide in 1936. Um, he had been ill with prostate disease and, and had a hard time making money, and um, his death was absolutely shattering for her. It was the only thing that, um, she was in France at the time too, and the only thing that actually raised her spirits was the Spanish Civil War, which was another example of anarchism, and she was able, she went and joined the fight, and it and, um, and was exciting for her, and then of course, um, the conclusion was not, to, was, was not what she had hoped, and she, she fled Europe, and that's when she came back, came back to Canada, when, the, when um, World War II was getting, getting, particularly getting ugly and brewing. Um, and then in um, May of 19, 1940, she died. She suffered a stroke the previous February, and uh, and after her, she was she was after her stroke, she was unable to speak. And a lot of her comrade friends said, you know, this this, this woman who who you know spent her whole life speaking out and 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 speaking to audiences and sharing her voice now was unable to speak, and they felt it a great tragedy. And then she died. And um, but her family and her friends um, lobbied the government to let her come back to the United States. Um, and so she was buried in, in the Waldheim Cemetery um, in Chicago, which is where the Haymarket anarchists who had so inspired her were buried. And so she was buried not far from them, and that's where she is today. And that's my speech. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And I'm happy to take any questions you may have. We have a few minutes. Yes? So you did that whole talk from memory, please, for the course. So oh, that thank was, you. That was terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you. you uh, at the end, you said that Eleanor Roosevelt was an admirer, and then earlier you said that Rich Poor would come mm -hmm. to hear her. So you're kind of shocking. I mentioned the Roosevelt must have known the Fricks or knew people in common. How did she have this ability to bring uh, and attract audiences of all different classes of people? Well, she, well, she spoke about, as I said, about many things, including, and, she, and one of the things that um, when she was traveling the country, when she was, st when she was still quite young, um, she talked about anarchism, but about also other things. And she was delighted that different people would come because she said then the people who might come to hear about or speak about the women's right, women's movement, or, um, or uh, you know, freedom of speech would hear about anarchism and be inspired as well. She just, she was a very charismatic person and she was an extremely intelligent person, very interesting person, very charming person. And she always had, once, once she reached her mid-twenties, she started getting a lot of attention from uh, writers and, uh, and, and, and leaders who, even if they didn't necessarily want to be completely associated with her, you know, enjoyed her company, um, thought she was intelligent, had interesting things to say. She had a lot of very wealthy benefactors. Um, Peggy Guggenheim actually was the one who uh, bought her that house in Central Pay where she wrote Living My Life, the art collector of Peggy Guggenheim. And, um, and, uh, and, and so it's just, she just had a lot of charisma and appeal, and some people were interested in her ideas even if they didn't think that necessarily um, abolishing all government and turning things over to, um, you know, to, um, to an anarchist philosophy was necessarily a good idea. They still thought she was an extraordinary person and were interested to see what she had to say. Yes? I have a question about the anarchist plan. If they were successful in uh, toppling the government, what had they planned to replace it? They, well, that's, that's what's so interesting. And here, one of the things that I found completely fascinating about Sasha and Emma is there were these two very learned, Sasha had an excellent education as a, as a, as a kid, and then they were you know, incredible, um, incredibly learned and knowledgeable about all sorts of things. And yet they had this fantasy that, that, that despite all signs of human nature, that you know, you, you over you people would just be it would be obvious to everybody. Once the workers, you know, overturned the capitalist system, everyone would be able to live in harmony. I mean, there were many different kinds of factions about communist anarchism and you know, individualist anarchism. Everyone had their own little ideas, but the basic system was that people could be trusted to live in harmony. It was a beautiful, it was a beautiful thing to do. In fact, at some Sasha sort of clung to this his whole life and never was was willing to give it up. Although he started to get a little bit depressed. Um, Later in life, when he when he's you know, he, but and but Emma sort of gradually recognized it's one of the reasons why um, she branched out a bit. She once she later in her life said that um, quoting someone about her that Emma Goldman is eight thousand years ahead of her time. But Sasha, up until um, almost the end of his life, really sort of clung to this notion that this was something he was going to witness before his death. It was because it was so obvious that this was the only way people could really be happy, the only the only thing that would be fair. But you know, the, rationally, I have no answer. <laughs> Yes. I'm wondering about your work process, considering that you inherited the project, mm -hmm. and you care about these characters. I wonder if your interest became, you know, 
much. I hear stories from my dad, and I always tune them out. Yes. But I inherited it, and it had a sense of your motivation to kind of grow from the burden of the weight. It was, well, he, he, I started writing shortly before his death. He was very ill. Um, and, um, and it, was, it was sort of a confusing time because I was sort of trying to do this project but also sort of you know, be both a daughter and a co-author. Um, and, then, and then I felt a lot of pressure, obviously, to, um, you know, to make it to be something that he would want, even though we had to slightly to try to coordinate our views on things. I mean, he had done a lot. He had been, he'd spent 40, 40 years. You know, he'd interviewed all these people around the world. He had, you know, their, their, their letters. Uh, Emma, um, after Sasha died, she collected all of his letters and, and papers and her own, and she brought them to um, a research library in Amsterdam. I spent a lot of um, a lot of summers, a couple of summers in Amsterdam, you know, playing with my sister. My father was, you know, transcribing these letters. So again, um, he, he had done. I had, you know, these wonderful, um, this this uh, incredible material. Um, but I just, I sort of waded into it slowly, and I, I you know, I, he had taken me out to dinner a lot when I was growing up, and he would tell me these incredible stories about, you know, about uh, how, you know, this federal agent tracked down this um, anarchist bomber across the country, and I would remember these stories, and I, and I say, oh, that's what he was referring to, that's what he was referring to. I mean, it's unfortunate that I can't now have a conversation with him, because it would be, because I know a great deal about it than I, than I did say when I was six. But, um, but so, so I just, I sort of, I try to sort of start from the beginning. I learned about these people myself. I read their, all their work, their memoirs. I read literally thousands of newspaper articles from the, peri from the period. Um, I read my father's books. Uh, I read all of his interviews. It took, a long, it took me seven years, so, so that was my process. Yes? Was your father around for the global justice movement in Seattle? No, he died in 2006. So, so I mean, he would see, he would see um, anarchists uh, events pop up here and there. I always regard them with either fascination or amusement, or amusement, depending on uh, how they progress. He would be very. I think it would be. It's, it's. I would have been interested to see how he would have looked at the last five years. Um, um, but you know, he sort of incorporated it all. It, you know, it was always intriguing to him. I mean, again, um, when I was when I was working on this book, I was just. Uh, and then the Occupy movement came up, and uh, you know, got so much attention. Just some of the some of the, the just the actual slogans and commentary were so similar to what had happened. Um, you know, they have a lot, lot to thank Emma and Sasha for. Anyone else? Okay. As Rebecca said, um, there'll be books downstairs on the first floor um, in the bookstore, and uh, I'll happy to go and sign sign them or just say hi. <laughs>